Unit 2 Second Supplementary A Shot in the Dark by Saki About the Author Hector Hugh Munro 18 December 1872 14 November 1916 Better known by the pen name Saki and also frequently as H. H. Munro was a British writer whose witty, mischievous and sometimes macabre stories satirize Edwardian society and culture. He is considered a master of the short story and often compared to O. Henry. Besides his short stories, he wrote a full-length play, The Watched Pot, in collaboration with Charles Munday. Here is an amusing story that describes how a man who considers himself very smart and observant finds that he had mistaken the genuine plea of a stranded youth. Characters in the story Fli Philip Slatabi, a man who aspires to become a politician, Mrs. Salfan Jago, a rich and influential lady of high rank. Bertie, son of Mrs. Salfan Jago, Cloud People Casey, a friend of Slutterby. Philip Slutterby settled himself down in an almost empty railway carriage with a pleasant consciousness of being embarked on an agreeable and profitable pilgrimage. He was bound for Bill Manor, the country residence of his newly achieved acquaintance Mrs. Salfanjago. Honoria Salfanjago was a person of some social importance in London, of considerable importance and influence in the country of Chalkshire. The country of Chalkshire, or at any rate the eastern division of it, was of immediate personal interest to Philip Slatherby. It was held for the government in the present parliament by a gentleman who did not intend to seek re-election and Slatherby was under serious consideration by party messengers as his possible successor and with luck the seat might be held. The Salfan Jago influence was not an item which could be left out of consideration and the political aspirant had been delighted at meeting Honoria at a small and friendly luncheon party, still more gratified when she had asked him down to her country house for the following Friday to Tuesday. He was obviously on approval and if he could secure the goodwill of his hostess, he might count on her nominating him as an assured thing. If he failed to find favour in her eyes, well, the local leaders would probably cool off in their embryo enthusiasm for him. Among the passengers dotted about on the platform, waiting their respective trains, Slutherby espied a club acquaintance and called him up to the carriage window for a chat. Oh, you are staying with Mrs. Salfan Jago for the weekend, are you? I expect you will have a good time. She has a reputation of being an excellent hostess. She will be useful to you too if that parliamentary project. Hello, you are off. Goodbye. Slatherby waved goodbye friend, pulled up the window and turned his attention to the magazine lying on his lap. He had scarcely glanced at a couple of pages, however, when a smothered curse caused him to glance hastily at the only one other occupant of the carriage. His travelling companion was a young man of about two and twenty with dark hair, fresh complexion and a blend of smartness and disarray that marks the costume of a nut who is bound on a rustic holiday. He was engaged in searching furiously and ineffectuously actually for some elusive or non-existent object. 
From time to time, he dug a sixpenny bit out of a waistcoat pocket and stared at it ruefully, then recommenced the futile searching operation. A cigarette case, matchbox, latch key, silver pencil case, and railway tickets were turned out on the seat beside him, but none of these articles seemed to afford him satisfaction. He cursed again, rather louder than before. The vigorous pantomime did not draw forth any remark from Slatherby, who resumed his scrutiny of the magazine. I say, exclaimed a youth voice presently, didn't I hear you say you were going down to stay with Mrs. Salfanjago at Bulmano? What a coincidence! My matter you know i am coming to there on monday evening so we shall meet i am quite a stranger haven't seen the matter for six months at least i was away yachting last time she was in town i am bertie the second son you know i say it's an awful lucky coincidence that i should run across someone who knows the matter uh, just as their particular moment. I have done a damned awkward thing. You have lost something, haven't you? said Slatherby. Not exactly, but left behind, which is almost as bad, just as inconvenient. Anyway, I have come away without my sovereign purse with four quid in it all my worldly wealth for the moment. It was in my pocket all right just before I was starting and then I wanted to seal a letter and the sovereign purse happened to have my crest on it. So I whipped it out to stamp the seal with and like a double distilled idiot I must have left it on the table. I had some silver loose in my pocket but after I'd paid for a taxi and my ticket, I'd only got this four forlorn little sixpence left. I am stopping at a little country inn near Bronte Quay for three days fishing. Not a soul knows me there, and my weekend bill and tips and cab to and from the station and my ticket on the on to bill that will mount up to two or three quid. Won't it? If you wouldn't mind lending me two pound ten or three for preference, I shall be awfully obliged. It will pull me out of no end of a hole. I think I can manage that, said Slatherby after a moment's hesitation. Thanks awfully. It's jolly good of you. What a lucky thing for me that I should have chanced across one of the matters Friend, it will be a lesson to me not to leave my exchequer lying about anywhere when it ought to be in my pocket. I suppose the moral of the whole thing is don't try and convert things to purposes for which they weren't intended. Still, when a sovereign purse has your crest on it, what's the crest, by the way? Slatherby asked carelessly. Not a very common one, said the youth, a demi line holding a cross, crosslet in its pow. When your mother wrote to me, giving me a list of trains she had, uh, if I remember rightly, a greyhound uh, on her note paper, observed Slatherby. There was a ting of coldness in his voice. That is the Jacko crest, responded the youth promptly. The demi line is self and crest. We have the right to use both, but I always use the demi line because, after all, we are all really salphans. There was silence for a moment or two, and the young man began to collect his fish, fishing tackle and other belongings from the rack. My station is the next one, he announced. I have never met your mother, said Slatherby suddenly. Though we have corresponded several times, my introduction 
to her was through political friends. Does she resemble you at all in feature? I should rather like to be able to pick her up out if she happened to be on the platform to meet me. She is supposed to be like me. She has the same dark brown hair and high color. It runs in her family. I say this is where I get out. Goodbye, said Slatherby. You have forgotten the three quid, said the young man, opening the carriage door and pitching his suitcase onto the platform. I have no intention of lending you three pound or three shillings, said Slatherby severely. But you said, I know I did. My suspicions hadn't been roused then, though I hadn't necessarily swallowed your story. The discrepancy about the crest put me on my guard, notwithstanding the really brilliant way in which you accounted for it. Then I laid a trap for you. I told you that I had never met Mrs. Salfanjago. As a matter of fact, I met her at lunch on Monday last. She is a pronounced blonde. The train moved on, leaving the soy descent cadet of the Salfanjago family cursing furiously on the platform. Well, he hasn't opened his fish, uh, fishing expedition by catching a flat, chuckled Slatherby. He would have an interesting story to recount at dinner that evening, and his clever little trap would earn him applause as a man of recourse and astuteness. He was still telling his adventure in imagine, imagination to an attentive audience of dinner guests when the train drew up at his destination. On the platform, he was greeted sedately by a tall footman and noisily by Claude People Casey, who had apparently traveled down by the same train. Hello, Slatherby. You spending the weekend at Bill? Good. Excellent. We will have a round of golf together tomorrow. I will give you your revenge for Hoy Lake. Not a bad course here, as inland courses go. Ha, here we are. Here's the car waiting for us, and very nice too. The car which won the Casey's approval was a sumptuous looking vehicle, which seemed to be uh, embody the last word in elegance, comfort, and locomotive power. Its graceful lines and symmetrical design masked the fact that it was an enormous wheeled structure combining the features of a hotel launch and an engine room. Different sort of vehicle to the post chase in which our grandfathers used to travel, eh? exclaimed the lawyer appreciatively. And for Slatherby's benefit, he began running over the chief points of perfection in the fitting and mechanism of the car. Slatherby heard not a single word, noted not one of the details that were being expounded to him. His eyes were fixed on the door panel on which were displayed two crests, a greyhound current and a demi lion holding in its paw a cross crosslet. The Casey was not the sort of a man to notice an absurd silence on the part of a companion. He had been silent himself for nearly an hour in the train, and his tongue was making up for lost time. Political gossip, personal anecdote, and general observation flowed from him in an uninterrupted stream as the car sped along the country roads. From the inner history of the Dublin labor troubles and the private life of the prince designated of Albania, he progressed with an easy volubility to an account of an alleged happening at the ninth hole at Sandwich and a verbatim report of a remark made by the Duchess of Patshire at a tango tea. Just as the car turned in at the bill entrance gates, the KC captured Slitherby's attention by switching his remarks to the personality of their hostess. 
brilliant lady level headed a clear thinker knows exactly when to take up an individual or a cause exactly when to let him or it drop influential woman but spoils herself and her chances by being too restless no response good appearance too till she made that idiotic change change queered slatabi what change what change you don't mean to say oh of course you have only known her just lately she used to have beautiful dark brown hair which went very well with her fresh complexion then one day about 5 weeks ago she electrified everybody by appearing as a brilliant blonde quite ruined her looks here we are i say what's the matter with you you look rather ill 